Um, so first I would like to thank the organizer, Bertrand and Pepe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be back here. So I enjoy very much this meeting. Uh, this is a talk about holomorphic geometric structures on compact complex manifolds. And um, first I will state a result which was an example for what I wanted to do. So it's a result of G's about um, classification of holomorphic codimension one foliations on complex tori. And uh, I want to think about this result as having a generic situation, which is the first part of the statement, and a uh, exceptional <coughs> part. Uh, first of all, for complex tori with algebraic dimension zero, meaning they only admit constant function as meromorphic function, they do not admit other meromorphic function, the only foliations are given by the kernel of a closed holomorphic one form. Since the holomorphic tangent bundle is trivial, those holomorphic forms are translation invariant. And this gives you all foliation of generic tori. So generic tori have algebraic dimension zero, and these are the only foliations on those tori. So here you have this complex torus. If you assume that the algebraic dimension is zero, then you can see easily that a holomorphic foliation of codimension one will be given by a map into the projective space, the space of hyperplanes in CN, which are tangent to the foliation. And since you assume that there are no non-constant meromorphic function, each such holomorphic function must be constant. So those foliation are translation invariant. Now there is an exceptional situation for those tori which admit vibrations over elliptic curves. If it is the case, you can pick up a non-constant meromorphic function on the elliptic curve and pull back this meromorphic closed one form, UDZ, from the elliptic curve and add any constant holomorphic form on the torus gives you a closed meromorphic one form, the kernel will be a holomorphic foliation. In fact, it will be a foliation with maybe poles because this form has poles. The point is that if you assume that omega, small omega, vanishes on the fibers of the vibration, what you get is the vibration. So it's holomorphic everywhere. And the point is that, in general, a local computation will show you that here you have a non-singular holomorphic foliation. So those, holo holomorphic, so those are holomorphic foliations. And they are not translation invariant, but still they have a big group of symmetries because all translations in the kernel of pi give you translations which preserve the foliation. So in fact, all these foliation, either they are translation invariant in the generic case, or they have a subtorus of codimension one which acts preserving the foliation. So you have lots of symmetries in any case. So the idea of this talk is to try to generalize this theorem for a broader class of geometric structure and for a broader class of complex compact manifolds. And let's see what kind of geometric structure I'm thinking of. Uh, the first one are, uh, which are good to have in mind for the, for the talk are holomorphic Riemannian metrics. They are complexified version of, of pseudo Riemannian metrics. So they are holomorphic sections of the, holom of the bundle of complex quadratic forms in the holomorphic tangent space. 
and you assume that they are of maximal rank. They are non-degenerate in each point. The flat case is the flat of the, say, complex Minkowski space, of complex Euclidean space. So here you can think of the flat case as being a GX geometry, where X is CN and G is the group of complex Euclidean motions. So a semi-direct pro product of the orthogonal group, complex orthogonal group, and CN acting on itself by translations. So this is like a flat Minkowski geometry. But of course, in general, there are local differential invariants, as in the pseudo Riemannian case. You will have a holomorphic Levi Civita connection and a holomorphic tensor of curvature, which shows you how far you are from the flat case. Uh, another example of geometric structure is given by affine connections. So, Affine connections in the holomorphic tangent bundle, so you can take derivatives of holomorphic vector fields with respect to other holomorphic vector fields. And uh, this operator is completely determined by this Christoffel coefficient. So in local coordinates, you can write the derivatives of the coordinate vector fields. And you have some holomorphic local functions, gamma ajk, a, which are Christoffel coefficients of the connection. And for example, when all of them are constant on Cn, that means that this connection is very particular. It is translation invariant. And it descends on, on complex tori on Cn over any lattice. So they admit this complex tori, they admit holomorphic of fine connections. The point is that in general, compact complex manifold will not admit this kind of holomorphic geometric structure. And all the situation will be very particular, very symmetric. And one could try to classify all of them, to classify, say, all compact complex manifold admitting holomorphic affine connections or holomorphic Riemannian metrics. I will give you some, however, some interesting examples. So the first one was the, well, are given by complex tori. Another interesting example are those manifold for which the holomorphic tangent bundle is parallelizable, meaning you have n linearly independent holomorphic vector field uh, in any a, a, a moving frame, which is holomorphic. And those manifolds are known to be exactly quotients of a complex Lie group by a lattice. So here P is a complex Lie group and gamma is a lattice in P. So those are palisable manifolds. And here you have holomorphic, flat holomorphic connections given by right invariant vector fields on P, which descends on P over gamma, and you decide that these globally defined holomorphic vector fields are parallel for your connection. Of course, uh, these connections are not torsion free because P is not abelian in general. But these are flat holomorphic connections on these quotients. And also, those manifolds admit holomorphic Riemannian metrics coming from right invariant complex quadratic forms on P. There are other nice examples of geometric manifolds given by the deformations of the complex structure on SL2 of C over gamma. If you take this palisable manifold, SL2 of C over gamma, uh, Gis showed that this manifold, this complex manifold is not rigid. In fact, you can see easily that this is a Clifford Klein form of some very geometric homogeneous space. You can think as x, x as being SL2 of C and at G as being SL2 times SL2, meaning here you have a holomorphic geometry which is like the complexification of ADS3. 
So the G action on X preserve the uh, holomorphic Riemannian metric coming from the Killing quadratic form on, on SL2 of C, which is like the complexified version of the anti de Sitter space in dimension three. So one can try to take the formation of SL2 of C over gamma by considering this GX structure a and def deforming the holonomy morphism from gamma into SL2 times SL2. And this gives you other holomorphic GX structures on the real manifold SL2 of C over gamma. And the point is that Gis proved that the underlying complex structure of these GX geometries are different. So as soon as the GX geometries are not isomorphic, the complex structures are different. In fact, the deformation space of the complex structure is exactly given by the deformation space of this GX structure. Meaning that you have interesting complex structures near this one, SL2 of C over gamma, which are exotic because the generic ones do not admit any non-trivial holomorphic vector field. So they are not parallelizable manifold. They do not admit any non-trivial holomorphic vector field, but they still admit a holomorphic Riemannian metric, which is locally isomorphic to this complexified anti de Sitter space in dimension three. So these are interesting geometric manifolds. But however, all the examples we have are very symmetric. So one could try to say something about the symmetries of holomorphic, ge holomorphic geometric structure on compact complex manifolds. So I will give you a first example in this direction, which is a theorem saying that on any complex manifold, you don't need compactness, of algebraic dimension zero, meaning the only meromorphic functions on those manifolds are the constant ones, all these geometric structure, which are called rigid in Gromov sense, should be locally modeled on some GX structure, at least on an open dense set, away from a analytic subset in the manifold. So let's, uh, let's say that this theorem comes, is inspired with, by a previous result of Bogomolov, which proved the same theorem for tensors, and also, of course, by the work of Gromov about rigid geometric structure. So the examples I gave you before, holomorphic Riemannian matrix and holomorphic connections and parallelizations are all rigid. Rigid means that local automorphism for the geometric structure is completely determined by a finite jet. And for connection, this comes because of the fact that a local automorphism will send complex, complex geodesics on complex geodesics, preserving parametrization. So local automorphism for connections are locally det determined by the one jet, by the differential. So this works for any rigid geometric structure. So the idea would be that there exists an open dense set U such that U is locally modeled on some complex homogeneous space for G uh, complex Lie group and H a closed subgroup. So maybe away from an analytic subset, you have a GX structure on your manifold, and the geometric structure is locally isomorphic to some G invariant geometric structure on, C on this homogeneous space. So the idea would be to extend this open dense set to all of the manifold to get, to get this GX structure on all of the manifold 
and try to classify compact complex manifold locally modeled on homogeneous spaces. So this is what I will show you here. It works if we put some extra conditions on the manifold or on the geometric structure. So let's see how this is a direct generalization of at least of the generic part in GIS theorem. So let's see why holomorphic foliation on complex tori with algebraic dimension zero must be translation invariant. In fact, this gives more. That gives the fact that any holomorphic geometric object on a complex torus of algebraic dimension zero is translation invariant. So, foliations are not rigid. There are too many local automorphisms preserving the foliation. Local automorphisms are infinite dimensional. But the point is that if you take a foliation on a complex torus of algebraic dimension zero, on the complex torus, you already have a rigid geometric structure, which is the translation structure. And this theory of Gromov enables one to put together the foliation or any geometric structure with this parallelization. So you put together in some extra rigid geometric structure all these translation fields on the torus and the foliation. So give you a geometric structure and by the first theorem since you are of algebraic dimension zero, this must, this must be locally homogeneous on a dense open set in the torus. Locally homogeneous means that you have lots of local symmetries because all vector fields in the Lie algebra of G will be well defined on the open set U as local vector fields preserving the geometric structure. So you have lots of vector fields locally defined preserving the geometric structure and they are transitive on an open dense set. So let's look to a vector field X which is a local symmetry for G. In particular, that means that the flow of X preserves the foliation and the flow of X commute with all these translations. But commuting with translation on the torus means you are a translation. So X is in fact a linear combination of translations. So it's a translation. So in fact, local symmetries are globally defined. They are translations. And they must act with an open dense orbit. So you, you must have all of them in the symmetry group. So in fact, here, local symmetries are all translations. In particular, the foliation is translation invariant. And it works in any dimension and for any holomorphic geometric structure on the torus. In particular, any holomorphic geometric structure on the torus come through a GX structure, through something which is locally homogeneous. So in particular, this GX structure is translation invariant. So any holomorphic GX structure on the torus is translation invariant as soon as the torus is of algebraic dimension zero. Translation invariant means that your geometric structure, your GX structure, is very particular. If you look to the holonomy morphism, going from the fundamental group of the torus into G, this will extend to Cn as a complex Lie group homomorphism, such that the image of this group Cn in G acts with an open orbit.
meaning that, in fact, the universal cover of the torus covers an open set in the model, and its GX G structures come from this covering and is translation invariant. And you take the GX structure on the quotient by taking the quotient by lambda. So this translation invariant geometric structure GX are very particular. And somehow you can decide now what GX structure can live on a torus with algebraic dimension zero. It gives you an algebraic criteria to decide what are those GX structure. It's algebraic. You need to find in G a subgroup isomorphic to Cn, which acts with an open orbit on X, meaning you need to find a copy of Cn in G, which is transverse to the isotropy. And then you do this construction, and they are all GX structure on complex tori of algebraic dimension zero. And the point is that uh, we asked with Benjamin McKay this question, is it true that all holomorphic GX structure on, on, on all complex tori are translation invariant? So those which are of algebraic dimension zero are, transla are translation invariant, but maybe not all of them. And we do not know how to answer in general to the question. We have some par partial answers, answers to this question. Yes, for dimension two, it's true for any complex torus. Uh, yes, if G is nilpotent, in general, those which are translation invariant So those which are translation invariant are a closed and open set in the deformation space of GS of GX structures. But uh, we don't know how to do this in general. And, uh, Sorry? yeah. What's, what's that vertical arrow for C and lambda? No, well, what I'm saying is maybe like this. Sorry. Yeah, the, other you, the other way. In okay. fact, you have the, the, sorry, the holonomy morphism, which is defined on the. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. And in fact, this picture, if you look exactly, what we did for, for the complex torus, exactly the same theorem is true. The same theorem is true for uh, parallelizable manifolds with algebraic dimension zero. For example, for for G, for P, SL2 of C, or SLN of C. Meaning all holomorphic geometric structure on palisable manifolds with algebraic dimension zero pulls back on P as right invariant geometric structures. And all GX structures come from this kind of construction, they are translation invariant. So if you replace the fundamental group here by gamma, you want to send it in G as a holonomy of the GX structure, it will extend to a group morphism to P such that the image of P acts with an open orbit in X. So it gives you, in general, a condition for a palisable manifold P over gamma to admit GX structure. Uh, as a corollary of this, SLN of C over gamma 
does not admit complex affine structures. You cannot find such a group morphism from SLN of C into the affine group of dimension N, which acts with an upper orbit with C on CN. This comes from the representation th theory. So it gives you somehow nice uh, result about the fact that those non-Keller manifolds, SLN of C over gamma, they do admit holomorphic affine connections. They do admit flat holomorphic affine connections, but they do, they do not admit complex affine structures. They do not admit flat torsion-free holomorphic affine connections. So this is for palisable manifolds. You can find other kind of results of the same type if you assume something about the topology of the manifold. Let's uh, assume here that the manifold is simply connected. Uh, the point is that those manifolds which are compact, simply connected, of algebraic dimension zero, they will not admit holomorphic affine connections. The assumption about the topology is important because those SLN of C over gamma, they are of algebraic dimension zero. They have, they, they have connections, but of course they are not simply connected. Uh, so the proof goes like, like this. First, there is a very general argument uh, about symmetries of those connections. Yeah. Oh, maybe it was wrong argument. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this was the first argument. As soon as you have any rigid geometric structure on those manifolds, you have lots of symmetries which are globally defined. In fact, toro toroidal means that you have an action. So toroidal. <laughs> toroidal means action of C star to the N with a dense open orbit. Uh, good example to have in mind as a toroidal manifold admitting a fine, connect, a fine structures, but not simply connected, of course, are the following. Uh, think about Hopf manifolds. Uh, let's do it in dimension two. So a surface. Take the quotient of Z1, Z2 by a, non, by a linear construction with different eigenvalues. Give you a surface which is diffeomorphic to S1 times S3, there is a complex affine structure on the quotient. Uh, the quotient is a smooth manifold assume, as soon as you assume there is a contraction here. You have a complex affine structure on the quotient. And you also have an action of this toroidal group given by two by two diagonal matrices because this action commute with the group for which you, by which you take the quotient. So this action descend on the quotient in an action which, is, uh, which has an open dense orbit away from the projection of the axis. On those hop surfaces, you have two elliptic curves coming from the axis. And this action will be transitive away from these two elliptic curves. And these two elliptic curves will be the only curves in the surface, so the, so the algebraic dimension is zero. But of course, this is not simply connected. If you want to have a simply connected example, you need to take an adaptation of this, take what we call Calabi Ekman manifolds. It goes like this, take C2 minus zero times C2 minus zero. 
and take the quotient by a one parameter group, which acts properly and freely, and the action is holomorphic. So you will get a quotient, which is a complex, compact manifold of dimension three. In fact, one can see that M is diffeomorphic to S3 times S3. If you put S3 at, at, as the unitary sphere in C2. So this is a complex structure on S3 times S3. If you take this one, you can see that you have a vibration over P1 times P1. So it's not of algebraic dimension zero. But you can take a deformation of the C action, of this action, as a one parameter subgroup in the linear space of C4, such that A is generic and A is semi simple. Is A, if A is generic, this gives you the fact that the manifold is of algebraic dimension zero. And if A is semi-simple, gives you the fact that in G GL4 of C, you have a big stabilizer, a big centralizer, a centralizer of dimension four. So on the quotient, you will get a, you will get a three-dimensional abelian Lie group acting with a dense orbit. So those are toroidal manifold of algebraic dimension zero, which are simply connected. In fact, they are very easy examples of a broader construction given by Lopez de Medrano, Alberto, Verzhovsky, and Laurent Mersman. And recently, there is a paper sh uh, proving that generically, these manifolds are of algebraic dimension zero, uh, published by Panov, Verbitsky, and Ustinovsky. So these manifolds of Lopez de Medrano, Verzhovsky, and Meresman are very nice construction of non-Keller toroidal manifolds of algebraic dimension zero. Many of them admit complex affine structures. Some of them are simply connected, but with no complex affine uh, structure, with no holomorphic affine connection. So let's see how one can prove this proposition one. The, the, the starting point of the, pro how, how one can get this toroidal action, starting with the geometric structure. The, the, the first part of the proof will be to construct those globally defined vector fields on the manifold. And this comes from a theorem of Nomizu, which was first a theorem about killing fields for real analytic Riemannian metrics. But this theorem was generalized by Gromov and Amores for any rigid geometric structure. And the point is the following. If you assume analyticity and you look to, for local symmetries, which exist here because we are in algebraic dimension zero and the previous theorem says that you have lots of local symmetries. We, are, we want to show that they are global. And Nomizu theorem says that you can extend those vector fields along any pass in the manifold, such that at the end of the pass, the germ on, of, of the killing field only depend on the homotopy class of your pass. In particular, if you are simply connected this local symmetry will extend to all of the manifold. If moreover you are compact, this globally defined vector field is complete. So you have a one parameter group acting on the manifold 
and preserving the geometric structure. So, of course, here we use this nomizo result because our manifold was assumed to be simply connected. So we have globally defined vector field. I will denote by A all those globally defined vector field of the manifold such that their flow preserve our, say, geometric structure G. So G was our rigid holomorphic geometric structure, but you can think about the connection. Sorry, yeah. No, no, th this, this result is about extension of local symmetries. So the point is, uh, of course, in the real situation, you, you cannot have this. You take a flat metric. Here you have translation. Take a perturbation. Translation, which are here, will not extend. So the, the, this, this results say that it's about extension of symmetries. So, so maybe what happens here is if you start with uh, lots of vector fields in the open dense set, they will act transitively. Then you will extend them, and you come on this analytic subset where they, are, where, where, where they do not act transitively. They become in somehow collinear here. But the point is they extend. So I don't, I don't say the action is transitive. I, think, I say all these local vector fields extend to all of the manifold. Right. OK? So this, yes, sorry. Is this for a nice It's exactly like, like happened in Hopf. Look here for, for this group. Sorry, this group. The vector fields are Z1, DDZ1, and Z2, DDZ2. So they extend and they become collinear on the two elliptic curves, which are the axes, where Z1 and Z2 vanish. It, 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 it was the... Okay, so you have those globally defined vector fields whose flow preserve the geometric structure. Now, like before, it's a trick. You put them together with the initial geometric structure in some extra geometric structure. So you take another geometric structure in which you have your initial one and those vector fields. Gives you another more stringent geometric structure. And you do the same for this new rigid geometric structure. You look to A prime, which are those vector fields whose flow preserve G prime, meaning the flow preserves both G, the initial geometric structure, and commutes with all symmetries of G. So by definition, being in A prime means preserving both G and vector fields in A, meaning that A prime is in the centralizer of A. In particular, A prime is a billion. And since your manifold is still of algebraic dimension zero, A prime must be transitive on an open dense set. And since the manifold is compact, A prime is in fact the Lie algebra of a group, G prime, which acts with an open, dense orbit. So there is an abelian group on the manifold preserving the geometric structure and acting with a dense, open orbit. And a little bit of work shows that it is toroidal. It descends on C star to the end. And now, the second step of the proof it's local. It's only differential geometry 
about symmetries of a connection. So if you look to a billion Lie algebra acting by symmetry with a dense orbit and preserving a connection, they will also preserve a flat torsion-free affine connection. So this is local statement about symmetries of a connection. And uh, uh, I will not prove here proposition two. I will say something later on. The point is that proposition two implies the theorem. Because for simply connecting manifolds, the, de the developing map of a GX structure is directly defined on the manifold because the manifold is simp simply connected. So if you have an affine structure, the developing map of the affine structure will be defined directly on your compact manifold. And there is a contradiction here. It in fact gives you the idea of why this theorem sh should be true. The developing map defined on M into Cn, which is the space of the GX structure, should be a local diffeomorphism. For, but on the other hand, it's holomorphic, so it must be constant. So this is a contradiction at the end of the proof. The, the, the second step of, of the theorem was proved in dimension two before by Adolfo and me in an attempt to understand those affine connections which are locally homogeneous on an open dense set, but not on all of the manifold. We try to understand if it could happen, starting with this result about algebraic dimension zero, can one have something which is quasi-homogeneous, meaning it's locally homogeneous on an open dense set, but not on all of the manifold. And uh, this is an example which was found by Adolfo. Uh, example is like this. Um, you assume it's a polynomial connection in C2. Every crystal coefficient vanish except this one. And you can easily find symmetries. You will find K1, which are translations along Y axis, uh, along X axis, and K2, which is an, an affine uh, vector field. Both of them preserve the connection. And in fact, uh, not only both of them preserve the connection, but they, they span all the symmetry algebra of this connection. The symmetry algebra is this one of dimension two, which is non-commutative is the Lie algebra of the affine group of the real line. Another way to see that this connection is locally homogeneous away from y equals zero is to compute curvature and to see that this tensor vanishes exactly on the geodesic y equals zero. You can notice also that k1 and k2 are affine vector fields, so they preserve the flat affine connection. It's a subalgebra of a bigger one which preserves the flat affine connection, which is exactly what happens in the previous example. Uh, and after that, with Adolfo, we gave complete classification of germs of connections, which are quasi-homogeneous like this. We have formulas. But I will give here um, a qualitative statement. statement. So we, I will say less. So, here is the classification of germs of connections. In all situations, so I don't give formulas here, but in all situations, the symmetry algebra is either the affine algebra of the real line, so dimension two, non-commutatively algebra of dimension two, or SL2 of C. In the first situation, the exceptional set where the, killing, where the symmetry vector fields drop rank they collapse, it will be on a complex geodesic going through zero. In the second situation, the exceptional point where they are not transitive is the origin. And in all situations, in adapt coordinates, those vector fields are affine. So they preserve 
a flat torsion free affine connection, the stardown connection. So, in some sense, in this result, there is previous step two in the theorem with McKay for dimension two. It's proved here. And also, since you have a, this flat affine connection which is preserved, you have this general statement about, which is about differential geometry of manifolds admitting this kind of quasi-homogeneous quasi holomorphic affine connection. They also admit a flat torsion-free, a complex affine structure, which is preserved by the same symmetries. The important point here that is that here in the complex setting, none, none of those germs extend on a compact surface. They do not extend. And to check this, one can use, uh, so this is a result about classification of local geometry of holomorphic affine connection on complex surfaces. The point is that we know all compact complex surfaces admitting holomorphic affine connections. There are hop surfaces, Inuit surfaces, uh, tori, Kodaira surfaces, vibrations, elliptic vibrations. There are classes. Uh, I want to see this theorem as the equivalent of G's theorem in somehow. There is a generic case and an exceptional case. The generic case says that the connection is locally homogeneous. It's like the generic case in G's theorem. The exceptional case is the case of a vibration, elliptic vibration of a Riemann surfaces of genius G greater than two. And here on this vibration, which is the exceptional case, you have flat connection, flat torsion free affine connection. But as soon as the connection is not flat torsion free, there is only one local symmetry, which in fact is global, extends to, an, to, to a globally defined vector field, which is given by the fundamental vector field of the elliptic vibration. It's more or less like, for me, like in, formally, it's like in GIS classification. They are the less symmetric connections on compact surfaces, and still they have some symmetry. So there's a natural question here, in higher dimension, what would be the less amount of symmetry for, for a holomorphic affine connection in dimension n on a compact manifold. Here we see that still we have some symmetry. And uh, one interesting corollary of this is that all these connections are projectively flat. If you forget about parametrization, if you look to the geodesics, but you forget about the parametrization, locally you can rectify geodesics on line on P2 of C. So, and in fact, it's more general. Not only those affine connections are projectively flat, but if you take more generally holomorphic projective connections on surfaces, meaning that you are able to cover a surface with open sets, on each open set you have a holomorphic affine connection, and on overlaps, those two connections have the same geodesics if you forget about parametrization. This gives you a new notion of geometric structure, those holomorphic projective connections. And all of them must be flat if they live on compact surfaces. They are locally modeled on this projective geometry on dimension two. So once again, strong symmetry uh, condition, constraint on a holomorphic projective connection to live on a compact manifold. And the last example I, I will give is the example of holomorphic Riemannian matrix in dimension three. Uh, and this, uh, in a recent work with Karin Melnik from Maryland, we show that this kind of quasi-homogeneous germ of holomorphic Riemannian matrix, which exists for connections in dimension two, do not exist for holomorphic Riemannian metric in dimension three. In dimension two, this is clear because you have sectional curvature, which will be constant, so you will be locally homogeneous everywhere. In dimension three, uh, you need some work 
to show that this kind of degeneracy, when you have local symmetries, you extend them, they will not drop rank. They will stay linearly independent. But even in this proof, the important step is no meso theorem. That's why we do not know what happens for smooth germs of Lorentz matrix in dimension three. We do not know that if there exist quasi-homogeneous germs of Lorentz matrix in dimension three. So our proof uses real analyticity. So with this, one can see that the theorem about the algebraic dimension zero will say that any holomorphic Riemannian matrix on a compact complex manifold of dimension three with algebraic dimension zero is locally homogeneous on an open dense set, but the result with Karin Melnik say that the open dense set is all of the manifold. The more interesting point is that you can also prove that for algebraic dimension one, two, or three, uh, the metric is locally homogeneous. So at the end, we don't need the assumption of uh, about the algebraic dimension of the complex structure as soon as a holomorphic Riemannian metric lives on a compact complex manifold, it needs to come from some GX structure. Exactly as in this GIS examples of deformations. So of course, now one can try to classify all examples and to understand all these homogeneous spaces, G over H, which are local models for the holomorphic Riemannian metric. In a way, like in the Thurston list of all locally homogeneous Riemannian metrics in real dimension three, here we have locally homogeneous holomorphic Riemannian metrics in, dimension, in complex dimension three. And we try to understand these homogeneous spaces, which are certain list for the complex case. And in fact, there are four models here. Uh, the first two models are in the first part of the theorem, part I. Uh, those are of constant sectional curvature, the, the complex Minkowski space and the complex anti -de -Sitter space. Those geometries have compact manifolds locally modeled on them. The flat geometry can live on a torus, and the SL2 times SL2 geometry can live on SL2 of C over gamma or on the deformation space. So these two geometries are nice constant sectional curvature geometries which lives on compact manifolds. There are compact manifolds locally modeled on them. And there are still two other geometries given in part two of the theorem for which the symmetry group is solvable and of dimension four, and they come from holomorphic Riemannian metric, which are left invariant on the complex Heisenberg group of dimension three and on the complex Sol group of dimension three. The point is that here, in the second part of the theorem, we prove some Biber-Bach rigidity. All compact manifolds locally modeled on the Heisenberg geometry or on the complex Sol geometry, they are rigid in their realization. The holonomy group up to a finite cover will stay in a three-dimensional subgroup acting properly on the model. So it will stay in the Heisenberg group or in the Sol group. And in fact, our theorem says that in the second case, the manifold up to a finite cover is very rigid, is a quotient, is a palisable manifold, is a quotient of the Heisenberg group or of the Sol group. Since Heisenberg and Sol admit flat invariant holomorphic Riemannian metric, in any case, we are left with some constant sectional curvature holomorphic Riemannian metric on the manifold which comes naturally in the first situation because it comes from the GX structure and comes from this Biberbach kind of rigidity in the second case. Look, at the end, we are left to understand completeness for those holomorphic Riemannian metrics of constant sectional curvature. The point is that the result of Carrier and Klinger, which gives, which gives you completeness for Lorentzian metrics in this setting, 
they are not known and open questions in the setting of holomorphic Riemannian metrics. But we have a recent result of Nicolas Tolozon saying something interesting about those geometries. It's a larger, more, more, more general result, but I state here like this. If you assume that those GX structure in the flat case and also in SL2 times SL2 case, if you assume that the geometric structure is uniformizable or Kleinian, meaning that you take an open set in the model and a quotient of the discrete subgroup in G, which is compact, then Nicola is able to show, he proved it and published it, that uh, U is all of the manifold, meaning that um, you don't have other uniformizable example than the complete ones. And this is interesting also because it gives you the fact that all those GX structure, which are complete, are closed in the deformation space. Because if you take a limit of complete, on com of complete GX structure, at the limit you will have a uniformizable one. And for the second case, SL2 times SL2 or L times L with L semi-simply group of real rank one, there is a result about the fact that those structures which are complete is an open subset in the deformation space. This is a result of Fanny Cassel and Francois Guerito and Olivier Guichard and Anna Wienert. One of their result is the fact that if you have this kind of GX geometries in the second case, those which are complete are a open subset in the deformation space. So if you put together Nicolas' result with this one, you have the fact that in the deformation space, those which are SL2 times SL2, which are complete, is a union of connected components. So maybe there are exotic connected components we cannot see, but we can, you cannot find uncomplete ones by deforming a complete one. So anyway, all of these results go toward the direction that if you have a holomorphic geometric structure, like holomorphic imaginary holomorphic connection on a compact complex manifold, either it is locally homogeneous or there is another one which is locally homogeneous. And locally homogeneous means locally modeled on some homogeneous space. And you hope to use complex rigidity to classify all examples. So this will be very nice symmetric examples, not generic ones. Thank you for your attention.